Fantasy Football League podcast. I can't believe that we're back. Joe Johnson across the desk from me. I'm Joey Tysick, and we are here to do a little draft prep today. Uh, last year, we kind of went straight into the draft and kind of put it all together kind of short notice. This year, with everybody coming back, we wanted to give some people some, some prep time for next week's draft, which will be live at 6.30 next Tuesday. Um, Joe, how, how has your off season gone? Have you done any research lately or are you, you know, a, a crammer? Have you just started? I'm, I'm in that frame of mind. You know, I bought my fantasy magazine and I've been, uh, watching, I watched my first episode of, uh, I think it's called fantasy football now and, uh, watching the experts, uh, talk about injuries and things like that. So I'm definitely in that frame of mind. Uh, you know, it's weird. We're, we're three weeks into August, but there's already kind of a briskness in the air and mm -hmm. you can't help about thinking, uh, about football. And obviously the preseason is up and going, not that I, I get too much into the preseason, but, uh, yeah, I'm in that frame of mind and I'm already starting to think about who we're going to draft on draft day. Yeah. And I am one of the slappies that have not taken a break from fantasy football. Uh, there's podcasts all year round. And I guess just because of my boredom, I listen to almost all of them or at least one like a week. And it just, I don't know if it really helps, but it just keeps me in that mindset of like fantasy football is around the corner. And I don't know. It's, it's probably a problem, but. Well, after the Super Bowl, I definitely need a break, you know, but then the draft happened in Detroit and that kind of got everybody excited and. Mm -hmm you kind of want to see who's getting drafted. And it seems like ever since draft day, football's been lingering in yeah. the air. That's usually what I tell people is, you know, if if you're not crazy like some of us, to just pay attention to the draft a little bit. Try to figure out where some of these top rookies are. You can, just by watching um, the analysts and everything, will will basically tell you, like, these are guys to watch out for on these teams. Um, and obviously playing fantasy and the, the type of league that we're in, we only focus on the offensive side of the ball. Um, so it makes it a little bit easier. And then you can take a big long break until we get right around August. And then I usually say just kind of keep an eye on some injuries and training camp and some preseason games. Um, there's a lot of little injuries that you can kind of ignore, but you just want to keep an eye on things, I guess. And that's always a strategy heading into draft day is even if you're aware of some injuries, do you take that risk and stash someone on the bench knowing you might have a fresh player four weeks into the season, six yeah. weeks into the season? That's all part of the strategy. Mm -hmm. And I took that strategy for once last year, and I believe I drafted Cooper Cup. I can't remember if I drafted him in the second round or um, I think it was the late second round. Um and then I later took Jonathan Taylor, who was out for a few games to begin the season as well. So I took some pretty big risks compared to what I normally do, mm -hmm. and I won the league. Problem is, I don't know if it was because of those players. I think it was more <laughs> because of Christian McCaffrey. So, um, you know, take that with what you will. Um, but what we wanted to get into a little bit today is we want to talk a couple draft strategies and... Then we want to just kind of gloss over some players that we're excited about, some players that we're maybe not excited about. And then, of course, those rookies that we were talking about, which ones might be, you know, the Justin Jefferson's, Jamar Chase's. Um, so, Joe, when you get into a draft, what is the typical draft strategy that you try to accomplish in a regular snake draft? Well, without giving my opponents too much uh, insight <laughs> as to how I approach draft day, uh, you know, I've been playing fantasy football for 20 plus years. Uh, early on, I won a championship. Uh, so, you know, I was having fun playing fantasy football from the get go. Now, having come from that, those early days uh, where we weren't quite looking up stats in the newspaper, but it really wasn't too long after that. Yeah. Um, but luckily when I came on board, you know, we were using websites and, and checking stats on online. Uh, but I still consider that the old school days and, and one, one mentality that I have that lingers from those early days of playing fantasy football is the importance of the running back. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know the league is a pass happy league and I know a lot of people want to invest in wide receivers and quarterbacks to a lesser extent. But for me, I, f I, I feel like the bread and butter 
of anyone's team is that running back. And we're at the point now in the NFL where having a running back that gets the bulk of the car- carries is a rarity nowadays. Mm-hmm. So I feel that heading into the draft, there's probably five or six running backs that need to be targeted. And then after that, there's a, a pretty big drop off where people are in heavy rotation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my strategy going in is I, I want a couple of dependable running backs that I can count on and everything else is secondary to me. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that too, because like you said, with a passing league, a lot of fantasy leagues have gone to wide receiver heavy drafts. And this is one of the most wide receiver heavy first rounds projections that we've seen in a long time. There's only three, maybe four projected first round running backs. Yeah. And the rest are basically all wide receivers. And they're the same names that you hear year after year. But if you Mm -hmm. look at, you know, these cheat sheets where they have the top 300 players or whatever, it's like you said, you know, the, the top 10 or so. Uh, recommended uh, players that draft are the majority are wide receivers mm-hmm. and they're the elites. They're the, the chases and the Jeffersons and stuff like that. And yeah. you know, that's, that brings up another strategy when it comes to these elite uh, wide receivers is if, if you go in heavy on these receivers, whether you're in a snake draft or, or an auction draft, um, there's that risk reward thing where, okay, you can get an elite receiver early on, but what happens if they get hurt? I mean, that's always going to be a factor in fantasy football is injuries, Mm -hmm. but do you bank so heavily on an elite receiver that the rest of your team might suffer a little bit? And then when you don't have that receiver, you're done. You're toast. Or even if your team stays healthy, because I'm kind of on board with you this year, I might, I'm leaning a little bit more towards running back, maybe not quite as heavy. Um, but because people are going so wide receiver heavy, I've kind of flipped. It's like, you know, when, when they say zig, you zag kind of deal. Um, but the other problem with if you go wide receivers with maybe, let's say, your first two picks, then the problem becomes what running backs are left over. Yeah. And you have to be comfortable with those players. If you're not comfortable with those players, then you probably should run, get a running back in one of the first two rounds at least. Yeah, I feel that um, if you if you get, say, a couple of running backs early on, the depth of wide receivers is there. Like, there are going to be elite wide receivers on the board, even after you go one-two running back. Uh, the opposite is not true. If you do one-two wide receiver in the early rounds, there's slim pickings in the running back category after that. So I, I would recommend loading up on, on running backs early on and then hoping that there's some elite receivers that you can uh, add to your roster after that. Yeah. And right now I'm just looking at uh, Yahoo's top ranks and running backs are Christian McCaffrey, Brees Hall, Bijan Robinson, Jonathan Taylor, Derek Henry, Saquon Barkley, Jameer Gibbs, Kyron Williams, Isaiah Pacheco, Travis Etienne, um, Devon Achan. And right there, for me, Devon Achan is the first running back where I start to have some concerns. Why? And, because and of how to Mostert make, or, or? Because of Mostert, or? because of some injury issues that he had last year. Um, I am I get nervous about guys that are, um, you know, predicated on getting the big play. But just right there, like, for me personally, with me not loving Devon Achan, that was what, maybe 10 running backs that I got to, and I started to feel a little bit nervous. Yeah. So after that, that's a big fall off. So yeah. I have to think, okay, if I don't get one of these top 10 running backs, I might be in trouble personally. Yeah. And that's now, where you have to feel comfortable with. You talked about how McCaffrey carried your team last year. And, and again, it's the whole risk reward thing. You can go early on McCaffrey, hope for the best. Mm-hmm. Um, he's getting up there in age, but if if he gives you what you're expecting of him, you win championships. But he, there's a chance he could miss half the season. You mm-hmm. just don't know what you're getting with McCaffrey. It seems like since he's been a 49er, he's been a little bit more reliable than when he was a Panther. But, um, yeah, it's risk-reward. You know, do, mm-hmm. do you, with the first pick of the draft, 
you would think most people would get McCaffrey. Again, if injuries plague his season, you're, you're, you're done. Yep. You're toast. So I don't know. Uh, it's, I, I've always, you know, again, I'm, I'm focusing mostly on auction drafts, but I tend not to overspend on elite players early on because of the risk of injury and stuff like that. I would rather go with second tier uh, running backs and wide receivers where you might find a little bit more value and there's not so much at stake if you happen to lose one of these players. So right. I tend to leave the elite players for the other guys and try to build my team of more uh, second tier players. Mm hmm. Yeah, and, and that's the difference is too with auction and snake is that you have to be flexible with the way that your league is set up. Um, and then the other thing too, like in our ONTV league, it's going to be a quarterback, two running backs, two wide receivers, a tight end, and then a flex. We might add another flex, but that's up in the air at the moment. Um, but some leagues have three wide receivers that you start. So if you're starting three wide receivers, then those wide receivers are a little bit more valuable mm -hmm. because if you get the elite of the elite and you start three of them, then that could be more good for your team. Whereas because so many wide receivers are going to get drafted, when you get to the end of the draft, if you go too, too many running backs early, then your wide receivers might be not as good. So yeah. it's like weighing your league is a big, is kind of a big thing. And there's no guarantees either. I mean, I think to our auction draft that you and I are in a few years ago, there was one team owner who had what looked like an all-star roster of running backs. And I was like, how did we allow this owner to get so many studs in the running back position? And I remember once the season was up and going, she couldn't get a win mm -hmm. because her running backs disappointed. If I remember, it was like Derrick Henry and, and uh, Jonathan Taylor and, and you're like, oh my God, she's so loaded. And they did not perform and she was in big trouble. Yeah. So, you know, here you are drafting what you think are, are a, a team of elite players, but there's no guarantees. There's yeah. no guarantees that these top five or 10 guys are, are going to be the ones. You just yeah. never know. Well, and that's why I, in most of my drafts, I don't follow a specific strategy. So the big strategy strategy these days is what's called a zero running back. Ah, oh, that makes me cringe. And it's because the wide receivers have produced so many more points over the last couple of years than running backs that people are thinking if you take the elite of the elite wide receivers, you can be far and above better than the rest that they can make up for your lack of running backs. Um, because we found some decent running back value in the middle rounds. Um, but those are hard to find. You have to figure out which ones those are and you have to, you know, guess and guess right. So that's always tough. Um, so I, to me, and then, and then there's also the, the hero running back is what they call it, where you first round, you get like the Christian McCaffrey, Brees Hall, Bijan Robinson, and then you load up on wide receivers. And then your second running back is more of, you know, one of those middle ground late guys that you mm -hmm. just throw a flyer on. I okay. think one advantage that a running back has over a wide receiver are the goal line carries. That when your player, when your team is inside the 10 or inside the five or whatever, that it's more likely that your running back is going to get the, those six points. Now, you could be dealing with a frustrating team like the Atlanta Falcons last year and have Bijan <laughs> Robinson on the one yard line and never get a carry. Yeah. And obviously, they've remedied that situation in Atlanta. Um, but. Uh, overall and traditionally running backs have the advantage of that goal line carry. And I think it's more likely a running back is going to have a multiple touchdown game than a wide receiver. Now, obviously there are exceptions. I mean, Kelsey can have a four touchdown game easily. Right. Um, but more often than not, I think you're going to get more points in general with an elite running back. Yeah. And I, the only pushback that I would have is that, that creates the running back has, I would say, a higher ceiling because they can get those touchdown rolls more. The thing with the wide receivers, because we play in a PPR league, that ups every catch that they have, and that gives them a better floor than what a running back could have. Yeah. So that's where that kind of balances out. So it's kind of it's it's again kind of risk reward. Like, would you rather go for the big play touchdown and just go for the surefire win, or do you want to kind of slow and steady 
catch your opponent and beat them um, with receptions and things like that. Those well, are the safer points. <laughs> you, what you illustrate the point, too, is that uh, a running back who's going to catch passes has yes. a, uh, a ton of value because, yeah. you know, you think of those little dinks and dunks. I mean, how many times have you been playing a, against an opponent and you're watching a game and you're like, stop throwing the ball yeah. to his running back. Like Especially just, boom, 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 one after another. I feel like we had it a couple times last year, late, late in meaningful games, when the defense are, are trying to avoid giving up a touchdown. They allow the, they short, allow the short yardage game, and that's where the running back can get like three <laughs> or four points real quick, and you're like, oh, geez. Yeah. And it makes it nerve-wracking. So that adds value to the running back that can catch passes. Yeah. So it just depends on kind of – how you like to play fantasy football, that's the fun part about it. I tend to do the classic, boring, balanced approach most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, I like to kind of flip-flop back and forth. Um, I like to take a running back. If I'm up high in the draft, I would love to get one of those top three or four guys and then in the next round come back and get one of the wide receivers. I don't love the running backs in the second round as much. Um the only time I would maybe take two running backs, I do like taking two running backs at the end of the first round. So if you're a late pick in the first round, you get that early second round pick. I don't mind taking two running backs there because yeah. then by the time you get back to that 3-4 turn, I really don't like the running backs at all. So I, I kind of go balanced, but I also just, you know, I, I let the draft board come to me. I don't yeah. try to expect too much now in auction that's different because you can get wild with things you can throw kickers if you want in an yeah. auction. but when it comes to a snake draft i'm really hoping that when we would determine draft order this year that i'm in the top three or four positions because i feel you said you said you feel comfortable with running backs up until about the 10th position i'm i'm probably i i detect a drop off around position five like i'm really hoping to get one of the top three four five yeah running backs and maybe well, more than one and we'll that and that's just my comfort level like i agree with you those top three four maybe five they're the elite elite mm -hmm. but when you get to the six seven eight nine ten i'm comfortable with them but i know that i've i've gotten much less talent than those top guys now one position we haven't talked much about uh just yet is the quarterback position and i feel like this year maybe more so than recent years there is a lot of depth at the quarterback position where if you're not coming away with one of the, the three or four top elite quarterbacks, there's still some really solid choices where I feel that anyone who reaches too early on a quarterback is making a mistake because I think you want to load up on those other skill positions before you force yourself to start taking those quarterbacks. And I'm telling you, based on what happened with me and Patrick Mahomes last year, where <laughs> I think I barely started him last year, he had, he had obviously had a great NFL season. They won the Super Bowl, but he had a terrible fantasy season. And yeah. I learned then that I'm not going to reach early for a quarterback. <laughs> and if you want Mahomes, you could have Mahomes because I think there are a lot, a lot of solid choices. I mean, I'm looking at this list. I think the top. 20 or so quarterback positions are fairly solid. And yeah. I don't think you're going to see too much of a discrepancy in points uh, between those top 20 positions. So I'm, I'm going to wait on a quarterback. I don't think I'll draft kickers and defenses before a quarterback, but um, I think I'm going to load up on my quarter or I'm sorry, my running backs and wide receivers before I even start thinking about a quarterback. Yeah. I, I think people have kind of like, in the early days of fantasy football, quarterback seemed like a big deal. Kind yeah. of before, you know, there was all these analytics about fantasy football, all these podcasts and stuff. When it was in the, the early days of fantasy football, quarterback was still a sought-out position because they're the leader of the team. But as we've gone over the years, quarterback has shown that it's not it's not as important. Now, the last couple of years, um, maybe before last year, 2022, especially, I believe, 2021, there was a resurgence of the quarterbacks where Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Jalen Hurts, and Patrick Mahomes were far and above all the other quarterbacks. You're right. They had yeah. produced so many more points. And I think that skewed a lot of people in the last couple of years. So now they're thinking, I got to get a quarterback. Finally, last year, we saw them drop back off. And I think people are kind of learning to get back to that. Um, 
Now, if you play in a four-point-per-passing touchdown league like we do for our Yahoo League, then that pushes up the running quarterbacks because they get a couple more points. Um, mm. And the throwing quarterbacks lose a little bit of points um, because they're not getting two, two extra points per touchdown, um, things like that. So your running quarterback who can get you know, 10, 20 uh, yards gives you an extra two points or whatever, which make up for that passing touchdown uh, difference of points. Um, but then if you get into a six point per passing touchdown, like our auction league is, then maybe it's, you know, it's a good idea to take the the passing quarterbacks. Um, but either way, I don't think there's anybody that stands out so much that I would have to reach for them. I think for me, the dividing line between the quarterbacks I'm going to be going after and the ones I'm going to ignore, and this probably just sounds like common sense to anyone listening, is the multi-touchdown quarterback. The one who consistently might give you three touchdowns a game. When when you draft a quarterback and you get one touchdown a game from them, you're at a disadvantage. You're mm-hmm. not going to win this league. You need someone who's going to give you consistently three touchdowns a week. Now, maybe some weeks it's two, maybe some weeks it's one, but some weeks it might be four, some weeks it might be five. So when I separate the haves from the have-nots, I want a quarterback who's going to consistently give me multiple touchdowns. And that almost kind of negates the four point touchdown um, that if you're going to get three or four touchdowns in a Mm -hmm. game, then the four point thing doesn't really matter. So that's what I'm going to be looking for uh, when choosing my QB. Yeah. And the other thing I want to bring up too is um, I've always been a big fan of drafting Lamar Jackson in these drafts. Um, But the problem that's becoming with Lamar Jackson is, especially last year because I had him in our auction league. He can go off for 30, 40 points Mm -hmm. at any given week. The problem is, kind of like you said, there are some days where the Ravens are just beating their opponent with defense and slow, grinded-out play. He had one touchdown and maybe 40 yards on the ground, which gave him like 15 fantasy points. And when you're getting 15 points from your quarterback – you can get that from anywhere. Yeah. Um, and like you said, especially this year, I, uh, there's some rookies that I really like, and we'll talk about them when we get to the rookies. Um, but I just, I'm not going to, I'm not going to reach for a quarterback. My my rule of thumb that I've heard people say, which I, I think turns out to be really good, is when the draft comes to you and you look on the board and maybe the first 10 picks that you see are the maybe the highest rankings if you don't like any of the running backs or the wide receivers there, then maybe it's time to take a quarterback or a tight end, perhaps. Mm -hmm. One of those one-of positions. When you just say, I don't like the running backs or wide receivers here, maybe that's your time to look at quarterback. And that's kind of the rule of thumb that I've used the last couple of years. Um, So depending on where I fall in the draft, that will kind of determine what level of quarterback I get. You know, you and I were talking about this in the office the other day, and I really kind of like this strategy where when you look at the starting lineups of most NFL teams, some some teams are just really loaded uh, with talent at wide receiver and tight end. And that causes a struggle like, gosh, which wide receiver am I going to go after because there's so much talent on this team? Anyone could step up. Now, when you find yourself in that situation where you're looking at an NFL team that's just loaded with talent in the wide receiver position, that's possibly the quarterback you want to target because there are so many weapons there. So instead of taking a gamble on which wide receiver is going to step up, now you got to start thinking, there's a guy throwing the ball to these guys. Maybe that's who I should target. So that's a really great strategy is – Target the quarterback that's just loaded with weapons. Yeah, because it, it, to me, it go, it falls into that risk reward that we talked about. Where for me, I I get nervous when an offense is so good, and I know that sounds crazy, but like you said, there's so many wide receivers. Like I, I keep bringing up the Texans because everybody knows about the Texans this year. They got Nico Collins. They signed Stephon Diggs. Tank Dell is healthy and back. They have Joe Mixon, who's a pass catching running back. Um, even Dalton Schultz and Brevin Jordan are their two tight ends that are pretty solid. And CJ Stroud had one of the best rookie seasons of all time. Yeah. How do I determine who's going to get the bulk of all those catches? Yeah. Because it was Nico Collins last year, but they signed Stefan Diggs to a pretty 
sizable contract. Now it's only one year, but he's a notable wide receiver coming into this offense. Who can consistently get open. Right. And then Tank Dell, this is his second year now, and he had some big explosive plays. So I have to decide between three wide receivers and all these receivers go within the first five rounds of the draft. I have to pick one and say, I'm banking all of my money on this wide receiver. And if I lose out on that, I'm losing an early pick that I could have used somewhere else. Yeah. So I have turned and said, I want a piece of this offense. Why don't I go after the quarterback? Because then it doesn't matter who he's throwing to. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I have to admit, you know, talking about CJ Stroud last year in our league, uh, Drake, who had never uh, played fantasy football before, he had his reasons for drafting uh, C.J. Stroud pretty early, and yeah. we kind of laughed like, wow, you know, he kind of reached on C.J. Stroud, and then he started laughing. I mean, not that he had a great season last right. year, or that our that Drake didn't have a great season, but C.J. Stroud yeah. early on as a rookie uh, started producing some pretty solid numbers, and that always blows my mind. Like, here's a guy playing at college-level football, coming into the NFL, and there's a learning curve when you – move up into the NFL game. They say it just moves so much faster and people hit so much harder. And here's this guy who came in and took command of that offense and was playing like a seasoned veteran that blows my mind. And now he's in his second year. So I have a feeling that when the, the run starts on, on quarterback drafts in fantasy, CJ Stroud's going to be up there uh, near the top is, when those quarterbacks start going, people are going to start getting that feeling in their stomach like, okay, is CJ Stroud available? Yeah, and, and he, for me, is kind of right where the cutoff is for those top-level top, top level quarterbacks. And so if I'm in the draft and I see CJ Stroud go, then I'm basically telling myself I'm going to wait till some of the very last rounds to get my quarterback, most mm-hmm. likely. And that's just kind of where I'm at. What are your thoughts on uh, Anthony Richardson? I mean, watching oh, these fantasy shows and stuff, he's there's a lot of high expectations on Richardson, but he's yeah. not high up on my list because I, I just don't know what to expect from him and yeah. what kind of talent is surrounding him. So on the cheat sheet that I have here in front of me, man, he's he's recommended to go fifth among quarterbacks, and I'm like, Boy, that seems a little high for me. What are yeah. your thoughts on Richardson? He falls into that category for me of if the spot is right and I don't like the running backs and wide receivers at that point, I am 100% going after Anthony Richardson. Really? The problem is, like you said, he's gotten a lot of hype recently. And I'm thinking that his price value might go too high. And like you said, the, the Colts offense is kind of weird. Um, they have Michael Pittman. They have Jonathan Taylor returning. They got some new coordinators last year. They were figuring things out. Anthony Richardson was only in for three or four games. I drafted him last year. He looked really good, really promising, and then he got hurt. Yeah. Um, now, I can't expect that he's going to get hurt again. He's a big, giant quarterback. I think he's 6'5", 200, mm. so he's almost like Cam Newton in a way. Really fast. He can get you those extra points on the ground. But again, I, I'm not sure... If the price gets driven too high, I may have to pass on him. Yeah. But he was one that I definitely was looking at early on in the season as Ooh. a big bounce back um, because he has a big arm. He can run. And if they have Jonathan Taylor back and healthy, I think the two of them will cause defenses a lot of problems. Ooh. Similar to what people are thinking about what could happen with Lamar Jackson and Derrick Henry is you have to choose who are you going to defend, Lamar Jackson or Derrick Henry. And then that causes a lot of problems for defenses. So I think it could cause problems for other defenses against the Colts as well. But obviously the Colts are just, they're not as good of an offense. So it's a little nervy that his price is getting moved up so highly. Um, But I do like him as a player. I will say this, that if, if someone in our league takes a shot on him, starts him and he pays off, I will stand up and applaud you for taking that risk because I'm not that confident. I'm not, willing to take that risk and it's not so much Richardson it's like you said it's the Colts I don't know if I trust the Colts to be an elite team this yeah. year so if someone takes that risk and it pays off more power to you and yeah. I will I will hand the trophy to you at the <laughs> hey, end my, of the season my other thought process with that kind of thing too is again we said the quarterback position is so deep so if you take a risk on a quarterback and you feel comfortable with it like I said if I don't like the guys that are there I'm going for Anthony Richardson the nice thing about that 
is I can take Anthony Richardson maybe fifth, sixth, seventh round, depending on what goes on. If I feel like he's a risky quarterback, I can go really late in the draft and pair him with guys like Brock Purdy, Kirk Cousins, Jared Goff, very boring quarterbacks for most people. Yeah. But they just consistently year after year get things done. And I would feel fine having both of those quarterbacks. If I have Anthony Richardson, a more risky pick but high upside, I would pair it with a safer, good floor quarterback. Yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because sometimes I get my leagues all mixed up, but last year in our own TV draft, I, I reached on Mahomes pretty early. He was going to be my starting quarterback. And then way late in the draft, I picked up Brock Purdy. Mm -hmm. And throughout the bulk of the season, I found myself starting Purdy week after week. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, you were like, I can't believe you're starting Purdy over Mahomes every week. And I'm like, he's producing. Mahomes yeah. was not producing. And that mm -hmm. made me angry that I was getting more production out of a late, late round quarterback than a stud like yeah. Mahomes. And right. that's why you, it's so hard to figure this game out. Yep. And that's, that's again, it goes back to the risk. It's, it's like we talked about it. We talked about it multiple times last year, too, where on Becky's team, she had Tua and Lamar Jackson. Yeah. She played Lamar Jackson a little bit more because he had some big weeks. But at the beginning of the season, Tua was going crazy. Yeah. And she also had Tyreek Hill on the team. So we always talk about you want to have that hookup. That's always fun to have. But you can't. You, you feel like you can't sit Lamar Jackson. Yeah. So you, you do get into these little binds that can happen where you're like, man, there's an elite guy on my bench. How do I not play him? And then you run into that dilemma. And I think Tracy Woodrum, uh, one of our team owners, ran into this where every week it seemed like she made the wrong decision. She would start one quarterback and her bench quarterback would blow up. So then she'd start the bench quarterback and the other guy would blow up. And, yeah. and that's the risk you take when you have two stud quarterbacks is agonizing over that as opposed to just putting a guy in and just letting him, letting him start week after week. So I don't think it does anybody any good to have two stud quarterbacks. I yeah. mean, you could say, well, one might get hurt. and uh, Yeah, but you're agonizing over that decision every right. week. I'd rather – get a number one guy and then, you know, have a guy sitting on your bench. And like I said, last year I was lucky that Brock Purdy was out producing Mahomes. Otherwise I would have been in big, big trouble. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's get to that last position that we haven't talked about. We'll skip kickers and defense. We don't want to <laughs> bore anybody with that. Um, use your last picks on those for the most part. Um, but tight end. Yeah. Tight end has been, I know you have asked for tight ends to be annexed from fantasy football for a long time. <laughs> well, I, I used to argue that I didn't feel like we should have a mandatory tight end position, that if you want to play a tight end in the wide receiver slot, you should. And the reason I argued that is over the last couple of years is that there was only like three or four solid tight ends in the league. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm forced to start a crappy guy. Like, yeah. I hated that. <laughs> It's not the case now. I mean, yeah. you look at the list of tight ends. There are some guys stepping up, some new guys who came in, uh, you know, as rookies over the last couple of seasons who are now really panning out to be solid tight ends. So I don't feel as strongly about that today because there's a lot more tight ends to choose from. Now, unfortunately, some of the elite tight ends from the last couple of seasons are starting off this season hurt. Uh, or whatever, but um, there's a lot more depth at that position today than there was just a, a maybe a year or two ago. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's it's similar to almost the quarterbacks where a couple of years ago there's only a couple of quarterbacks that were far and beyond better than the rest. Tight end is kind of the same way, and you know Travis Kelsey is now 35, 36, and he's the oldest, and he's still you know the number one tight end. Some people are arguing Sam Laporta, which I can I can understand both sides of that argument. Yeah. Um, but there's also Trey McBride, young guys. And then you have a couple other veterans, Mark Andrews, George Kittle. And then you have Dalton Kincaid, Kyle Pitts. So there's a good mix of young guys and veterans that you can choose from. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that – it's going to be weird, I think, for tight ends because, like, last year Travis Kelsey was a first-round pick. Yep. And – this year, because he didn't play as much last year, he's going to get pushed back. So I think there might be a certain area where tight ends become a like a perfect value, mm -hmm. where there's going to be some of those top tight ends that you can get 
fourth, fifth, sixth round and feel really good about your tight end position. Yeah, I have a couple of names in mind that when tight ends start coming off the board, when it's my turn, there's a couple of guys I'm going to target. Um, so I have a couple in mind that I'm, I'm going to go after. And, you know, one name that uh, that comes up that I had some success with last year was uh, Ferguson. He was very, very consistent last year, especially late in the season. And uh, if he continues that sort of success into this season, he's going to be a guy that I'm going to look at and target. Um, but even if I don't get him, there's, there's, uh, I could come up with 10 tight end names that I'd be happy to add to my roster. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not too worried about the tight end this year, which is nice to say, I would think. Um, so now that we've gone through all the positions, we'll just kind of wrap up. We'll go through a couple of players we're interested in a couple we're trying to avoid and then, uh, some rookies. So Joe, who's kind of, those guys at the top of your list, you don't have to share all your secrets, of course. <laughs> I know, you know, our league mates are going to listen to these, but what are some of the players that you're excited about? Well, here's an interesting dilemma. So let's say, let's say I'm gifted the number one pick in the draft. Obviously there's a consensus of who that guy should be. And mm-hmm. according to the cheat sheet that I have here in front of me, uh, Kristen, uh, Christian McCaffrey is the number one guy to come off the board this year. I got to say, with the number one pick in the draft, if I were to get it, I don't know if I'd go McCaffrey. Wow. And only because of that risk of injury and stuff like that. The guy that I'm most excited about in the position of running back, and maybe just in in fantasy football in general, is because of the changes that they've made in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I am very, very excited about Bijan Robinson. Yeah. Um, now he's third on the list of running backs on this list, uh, bested, uh, only by Brees Hall, who's yeah. another very tempting guy to have first off the board. Uh, people are predicting a monster season from him, but the problem that I had with Bijan Robinson, I drafted him last year was they had that crazy coach who would like <laughs> bench him for long stretches of time. And mm-hmm. like I said, they'd be on the goal line and they'd run three passing plays with B. John Robinson in the backfield, I would lose my mind. Yeah, That coach is gone, and I think that's the Falcons' way of saying, we need to utilize this talent we have on our team. Yeah. I'm expecting a monster, monster season from B. John Robinson, and if I'm given the first pick of the 2024 draft, that might be my pick, B. John yeah. Robinson. All right, everybody, you heard it here first. If, <laughs> if you're in front of Joe and you want Bijan, you better take him. Yeah. Um, what about you? You're given the number one pick of the 2024 uh, draft. Who is that going to be? He rode me to a championship last year. I have to take Christian McCaffrey. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like if you go the number one pick, I want the highest potential outcome for me. And Christian McCaffrey has proven it year after year that he is just far above and beyond everybody. He had... Yes what the I don't even remember how many it was in a row he had a number of games in a row where he scored a touchdown yeah. to where his betting odds were minus money which is crazy yeah um now how old is he is, he's 28 29 so he's not quite hit that 30 right. wall yet okay. so he's getting there um but I feel like San Francisco is a well coached team they're a fluid offense so they don't work him into the ground yes he still gets a ton of touches it's a lot of catches. Like he just gives you everything that you want out of a running back. And I agree. I think Bijan could be that next guy. But if I'm going with the number one pick, I want the known quantity first. Yeah. Imagine, let's say I'm sitting in that first chair, the number one pick chair. You're in the number two pick chair. And you hear the words come out of my mouth. Bijan Robinson. You're going to be like, holy crap. Yeah. I mean, so. I, I wouldn't not, <laughs> I wouldn't like make fun of anybody for taking Bijan yeah. because I get it. Um, but I would be very happy. I would run up to the podium immediately <laughs> and say, Christian McCaffrey, you're on my team. Yeah. Um, if you were, uh, let's say you were eight, like, so the problem with a lot of people, they don't like the eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 slot for yeah. their draft. If you were put into that position, where would you go with your picks? Well, again, I, I have a lot of uh, emphasis on the running back. So regardless of where I am in that first round, whether I'm first or 10th, or uh, I'm going to go with whatever 
best running back is available. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, you know, if all the good running backs are going off the board and let's say I'm sitting at the eighth or ninth position, I'm not going to go with a different position because by the time it comes back to you, and there might be more running backs getting off the board. So mm -hmm. uh, at that position, I'm going to take the best running back available when it gets to me, whoever that might be. Okay. And the, the nice thing, like you said, let's say we have 10 teams and I'm in that 10th position and you get those back-to-back -back picks more than likely I'm going to take two running backs off the board. Hmm. Then I, I feel like I'd be done with running backs at that point. Then when it comes back to me, I can start focusing on wide receiver and, yeah. and other skill positions. But I, I want running backs in that first round. Yeah. I would say my go-to is if I'm later in that uh, slot, especially the back-to-back, -back, I really love the Jonathan Taylor-Jameer Gibbs combo. Mm. I think that seems like a perfect outcome. I think a lot of people are kind of sleeping on Jonathan Taylor. They forgot he was the number one pick a couple of years ago <laughs> um, and what he did in his rookie season. Um, Jameer Gibbs maybe is a little concerning with a hamstring injury. I hate to see that. Um, so maybe my tune has changed a little bit. I might go running back wide receiver. Um, but later in the draft, I do really, do really like uh, Jonathan Taylor this year. Yeah, as far as wide receiver goes, um, you know, that might be my third round. I might start dipping into wide receivers when round three rolls around. Um, again, I think I may have mentioned earlier that I'll I'll let other people take those elite uh, wide receivers and uh, target someone a little bit more middling. So if, if I do wait to the third round to go after wide receivers, that's probably what I'm, what's going to be left. I would imagine Lamb, Hill, uh Chase and Jefferson, they're going to be gone, I think, in the first two rounds. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll target a more uh, two-tier two wide receiver when it comes back to me. Um, so we'll see. You know, who, who will that be? I don't know. It just depends on who's on the board when it comes back to me. Yeah. Is there anybody that people aren't necessarily talking about as much or, you know, a guy that's a little bit later in the draft that you – seem like you would lean to want to have on your team well there's there's one guy i don't know if you know if you can consider this guy sleep or whatever but there's one guy that people are talking about he's getting a little bit of buzz and basically what they're saying is he may be back to elite form and you know i love him anyone who knows me know i love him i love me some cooper cup and there's some talk that he might be stafford's number one guy again this year so who knows when, maybe when it's time for me to pick a wide receiver, that might be my first pick is Cooper cup. It all depends on Stafford if he's healthy. Um, because you know, that's one thing that was weird with the Rams a season or so ago is when Stafford was healthy, that's when cup put up his best numbers. When Stafford got hurt and they brought in the backup that resulted in Cooper cup getting injured because he was overthrown he leapt up for the high pass, got taken out from underneath. I think he hurt an ankle or something, mm -hmm. and he was never the same since. Yeah. And so if, if you have a guy like Stafford hitting him in the numbers with the ball, he's going to have a monster season if Stafford can stay healthy. That's the big if. But that's probably the wide receiver that I'm really going to be keeping an eye on is, is Cooper mm -hmm. Cup. He could be back to elite status. Now, Puka, who could be giving him uh, some competition in that position. I guess he's dealing with some minor injuries, so we'll kind of keep an eye on Puka Nakua, but you can't deny what he did last year. I mean, he came out of nowhere, literally nowhere, mm -hmm. and had a monster season. So it's going to be interesting to see which one of those two guys are going to step up and have the better season. Yeah. The player that I'll mention that I'm kind of excited about and I'm, I'm kind of ramping up towards it is another one of your former guys, Chris Godwin. Love me some guy. So he's a guy that went under the radar because, you know, the Bucks, you know, they got a new uh, quarterbacks coach, kind of changed their offensive schemes a little bit. Um, Baker Mayfield got a lot more comfortable in their offense, and he targeted Mike Evans really early. And Chris Godwin, you know, his role got a little diminished. They sent him to the outside receiver role a lot. But when he was with Tom Brady, he was moved into the slot. And Tom Brady loves his slot guys. And we saw big years out of Chris Godwin. Mm. Now, Baker Mayfield is a little more of a gunslinger. 
but I've been hearing they've been putting Chris Godwin back in the slot a little bit more often. And I think they're going to try to implement him more into this offense on the underneath routes and get him back to kind of what he was. We saw a little bit of it last year. I think it was late in the year last year where he had a couple good games. Yeah. But he's a guy that's going so late in drafts that I just I'm starting to not be able to ignore him anymore. I feel like I know this might be controversial to say, but I feel like Godwin's the safer pick over Evans because yeah. Evans can either give you a monster season or give you nothing. It was so shocking to see a year or so ago that uh, Evans just couldn't reach the, the deep ball and, and they would sail over his head. And he just seemed to really struggle to outrun defenders and catch that ball. And, and so you're either going to get monster games out of Evans or you're going to get really bad games where I feel like Godwin is more consistent. So yeah. if I had to choose one of the two, I'm going to go with Godwin. Yeah. Plus, um, again, it's for value. Chris Godwin is late, late, late in the drafts. Mike yeah. Evans is third, fourth round maybe. So, you know, you could get a lot better value um, for Chris Godwin. Yeah. Now, what are a couple – I know you've kind of said wide receivers are not really what you're after – but are there specific players or maybe even a specific running back that you just don't want, even if they're highly ranked? You know, it's interesting. Um, there are certain teams that I don't touch. <laughs> and when someone like recommends a player from a team I don't like, I kind of roll my eyes and I'm like, you could have them. Uh, I got burned a season or two ago by Najee Harris. I uh, I think he was on the waiver wire. I think someone flat out cut Najee Harris, and I picked him up on the waiver wire, and he was kind of a disaster. And uh, a lot of people seem to be high on him heading into this season that Najee Harris is going to have sort of a rebound season. I don't like the Steelers. I don't draft the Steelers, and I am not going to touch Najee Harris. Now, again, if you draft him and you have luck, Maybe he just belongs on your team, but he does not belong on the Hollywood Blockbusters team because the time I did pick him up, I got burned by him. Same thing applies to, uh, there's a couple other teams. I'm not a big Dallas guy, even though, like I said, I may target the tight end Ferguson. Um, but there are just certain teams, the Packers, I don't, I don't draft Packers. Maybe it's yeah. just me being a Lions fan, but there are just certain teams I avoid. And if, if you want those players have Adam. I'm not going to give you any uh, competition for him. Yeah, I I'm for sure with you on avoiding the Steelers this year. They look like a mess. <laughs> At one point, I thought maybe Justin Fields might be good. Maybe George Pickens would be somebody to go after. I'm not touching them with a 10-foot pole at this point. Yeah. Um, My guys that I'm avoiding, I know this is going to hurt your heart a little bit, Um, the Rams guys, and it's and not Cooper Cup. Cooper Cup I like. It's the early round guys, Puka Nakua and Kyron Williams. Ooh, interesting. The two, the two biggest breakouts of last year scare the crap out of me. Um, and again, it, it goes back to value. Puka Nakua had his big blow up when Cooper, Cooper Cup was not on the field with him. Mm -hmm. And when we saw Cooper Cup come back is when Puka came down to earth a little bit more. Yeah. Um, he still had his big weeks. I mean, he gave me a championship. He was part of my winning team. Um, but he didn't do as good as he did in the early season. So now that we're going to get potentially a full season of the two of them, I'm nervous to take Puka Nakua that early in the draft. Now, if he fell to me like late in the second round, I might be more comfortable with it, but he's right at that one, two turn. And that's just a little too rich for me. Hmm. Um, and the same goes with Kyron Williams. I said it a ton last year and maybe he'll keep proving me wrong. He's one of those guys. Um, that, you know, if, if he does well on another team, I'm fine with it, but I just don't want him on my team because it, to me, when I watch him, he just does not, he does not look that good on the field. Interesting. And he's just one of those guys that gets it done. He, he produces, I can't yeah. deny that, but I just don't know where this offense is going to go. Their offensive line is going to be better this year. So they might be back to throwing the ball more with Stafford. Um, they might feel like he can go back to gunslinging a little bit, so they might not need to run the ball as much, or they might just be a little bit more balanced. Last year, it seemed like they were, you know, run heavy and then throw deep balls to Puka Nakua. And I just, I'm nervous about what that offense is going to look like. See, what's exciting is if the, the passing game for the Rams can get it together, 
it makes Chiron that much more exciting because you have to play the 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 pass to try to keep the Rams honest. And this goes for any passing right. mm-hmm. first NFL team that if you have to play that pass because they have so they're so loaded in that position, that means the running back can run all day long. Yeah. Now if you load the box against the running back, then they're going to pass on you all day long. So I'm I'm excited about running backs who are on uh passing first teams because if they have to play the pass to keep them honest, then the the running back just has all kinds of lanes. And so yeah. that's why I'm kind of excited about Kyron is that uh if the Rams passing game can get going and when you're looking at Puka and Cup and and all that, uh he could have a big season yeah. despite the fact that they might be a pass first team, but yeah. I'm telling you, and I, I almost hate to say this. I hope no one from our auction league is listening to this, but if I can get Bijan and Kyron mm. on my team, I'm not going to guarantee a championship because <laughs> yeah. that blew up in my yeah, face. Don't try to do that again. But I will be very, very happy if my two starting running backs will be Bijan and Kyron Williams. Yeah. Um, the other one little note about Kyron, they did draft Blake Corum out of Michigan as his backup. It was concerning a little bit um, when it first happened. Um, I'm not as concerned about that. I think he's more of an insurance policy where if Kyron got hurt, he could be a really good handcuff to have. Um, so if you do go after Kyron, I would say maybe look at going for Blake Corum yeah. just because they're very similar players. Blake Corum is probably a little more polished, at least coming out of college. Um and that might be something to look at potentially. Yeah. Speaking of handcuffs, uh, I, I I can't remember if I did this last year or not, but if, if you do end up with Bijan Robinson, might want to stash Algiers on your bench because that kind of blew up in my face last year was I was I was so high on Bijan and Algiers kept poaching touchdowns and yeah. getting carry. So uh, if you want a handcuff, that's a handcuff you want to stash on your bench. Yeah. Um, finally, with the last few minutes, let's take a look at a couple rookies that we're uh, looking out for. Do you have a couple in mind, Joe, that you wanted to bring up? I wanted to say that over the last few years of playing fantasy football, uh, this year is a bit of a disappointment. <laughs> I know it's shocking. And, you know, I got to say, I don't really follow college football all that much. Um, but every year come draft time, I, I look at what the experts are saying about, uh, rookies and I try to pick up a couple of them and hope for the best. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I don't see any names on this year's list of rookies that I feel like I really need to stash on my bench, uh, and hope for the best. I mean, I'll probably do it out of habit just to pick up a couple and stash away, but there's nobody that I'm going to waste a high draft uh, selection on. Uh, if there's some rookies available late in the draft, I might stash them. But I can't say there's anyone I'm really excited about that I would have to have on my roster. What about you? I'm kind of the opposite. Now, <laughs> now I understand you're you're kind of the running back guy. So the running back is pretty slim pickings. Uh, Jonathan Brooks was a big one coming in. Um, but he seems like he's still recovering from his ACL tear from college. Mm. So he's probably going to be out first couple weeks of the season. And then you have a rookie running back trying to get on the ground running already kind of late into the season. He plays for the Panthers. It's just not great. Yeah. Speaking of which, I mean, looking at this list I have here in front of me, these are all, all skill positions are ranked here uh, as far as rookies go. And the highest ranked running back, uh, rookie running back, is the guy you just talked about, Brooks, which is so shocking because when it comes to rookies, the position that normally rookies can enter the F, the NFL and hit the ground running is the running back position. There's, you know, you don't have to necessarily learn routes and all that stuff. You just get the ball and find a hole and go. So rookies tend to excel in the running back position, and those are usually the higher-ranked players. But in the case of this year, the the highest-ranked running back is ranked seventh on this list, which is so shocking and tells you the caliber of running back that's available this Mm -hmm. year. And that's why I said I'm excited about the rookies, but it's not the running backs. (laughs) The wide receivers are really exciting. The problem is, like I've been saying kind of the whole time, the value on those those wide receivers 
because of the Justin Jefferson years, because of the Jamar Chase rookie seasons, Puka Nakua, we've seen multiple wide receivers break out in their immediate rookie season. Marvin Harrison is a back of the first round, early second round pick as a rookie. And that terrifies me <laughs> because that is so much value banked on a rookie. Whereas mm. all those guys before Puka Nakua went undrafted in right. many places. Jamar Chase was sixth, seventh, eighth round pick. Justin Jefferson, 10th round, I think, when I got him his rookie season. Mm. That was usually the fun of the value of those wide receivers. Marvin Harrison is so high that you have to be certain that he is going to be that guy. And he yeah. definitely could. He has the pedigree. But do I want to risk it all of my first or second pick on a rookie? No, thanks. Yeah. Personally. I, I won't. I won't draft my first rookie until all my uh, starting roster is filled. Then when I'm starting to pick bench players, then I might look at some rookies. But I'm not going to waste a starting lineup spot on a rookie this year. Yeah, but outside of Harrison, Malik Neighbors is one that I really like. Problem is he plays for the Giants, so you have to weigh that. Daniel Jones has not looked good in the preseason, but Malik Neighbors is basically one of their only big name wide receivers. They've had an early connection. They might just force feed him the ball. And in a PPR league, he might get, you know, seven catches, eight catches a game just because he's getting 15 targets a game. Yeah. And that's just a nice floor. And his draft uh, ranking hasn't gone too high yet to where I'm nervous of drafting him. Then you have Roman Dunze uh, for the Bears. He's a big uh, bodied receiver that can stretch the field. The Bears have a really good, Good looking offense right now, so he could do something. Keenan Allen hasn't looked as good, so maybe Odunze could be the second wide receiver on that team. Um, Xavier Worthy, he's like a Tyreek Hill playing for Patrick Mahomes. You always want to try to tie yourself to a, a Tyreek Hill, uh, Patrick Mahomes wide receiver. And um, yeah, there's just a lot of guys like Lad McConkey, he might be the number one wide receiver for the Chargers as a rookie. Brian Thomas. For Jacksonville, he's a deep threat kind of guy. Keon Coleman, he's the big threat for the Buffalo Bills, and Josh Allen doesn't have Stephon Diggs anymore, so somebody could replace him. Um, so I like some of those wide receivers, and they're going super, super late in the draft. And uh, I like to usually take a chance on at least two of the rookie wide receivers late in drafts. I agree. I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't mind having a couple of rookies on my roster, but like I said, I'm not going to reach for them. If yeah. they're available in the later rounds, I might just stash some yeah. for fun and see what happens. And it's always fun when, when you get a breakout rookie who who's comes into this league and just hits the ground running. It's so impressive. So yeah. we'll see how it plays out. The other two I want to mention are the two quarterbacks at the top, Caleb yeah. Williams and Jaden Daniels, both a little bit of some running Caleb Williams, not as much Jaden Daniels might run a lot. Um, so if you want those kind of what they call free points for quarterbacks, that might be an effective way of getting those. Uh, but he's looked pretty solid in the preseason. Now he is tied to the Washington Commanders. So <laughs> depending on how you feel about that, could be risky. But again, it's a really late pick. Could be a lot of upside. Caleb Williams, one of the highest um, ranked quarterbacks that we've had in a long time. Just coming out of the draft, people have compared him to some of the best quarterbacks out of drafts um, in the past. So there's a lot of pedigree there for him. The, the Bears, like I said, they did improve their offense. So there's a chance he could hit. And these are just taking swings late in a draft that could maybe win you a league. I I never have and I never will draft a rookie quarterback. It's, like I said, this game moves so fast coming out of college. There are exceptions. I mean, obviously, C.J. Stroud figured it out fairly early on last season, but I will never risk a fantasy championship on the shoulders of a rookie quarterback. <laughs> Other people can take that chance. I need someone who's a seasoned veteran uh, in the pocket. Yeah. All righty. Well, that's uh, basically all our time. Uh, Joe, do you have any last final tip that you could give somebody going into next week's draft or whenever the drafts occur? Um, what would be like your number one tip? Uh, save uh, kickers for last, <laughs> especially in an auction league, man. It drives me crazy when I see someone bid $5 on a kicker. I'm like, what are you doing? doing don't <laughs> spend money on a kicker the yeah. the difference in points is negligible like don't do that 
Uh, defenses might be a little different. You, you, you could get a defense a little earlier than kickers, but not before the skill positions. Mm-hmm. Like, save that stuff for, for later. So, you know, fill up that starting roster with the, the skill positions and then do kickers and defenses late. They'll they'll be there for you. Don't, yeah. don't go crazy. Mm-hmm. And my number one tip before we leave, don't panic. That oh, is my biggest a one. A long season. Um, yeah, a long, long season. You can make a lot of moves. But even in the draft, don't panic if you don't get your guy or you don't get your correct position. You always just want to remain calm. Look at the next guy up that you think could be that guy, especially when it comes to an auction draft. Last year, we saw our prices skyrocket, and it made us all a little bit nervous right <laughs> off the bat. So just don't panic. Stay calm. And uh, like and, you said, and go long with, season. Go with your gut. Like, you know, don't don't rely so heavily on the experts. Go with yeah. your gut. This is supposed to be fun. Right. Draft the players you like. Have fun with it. Don't get all burnt out. Just have fun. Yeah, that's probably the most important role. Yeah. Um, but this has been the ONTV Fantasy Football League podcast. We'll be back, like I said, next week. Our live draft at 6.30. Going to be a lot of fun. And then after that, we'll be doing our weekly podcast once the season starts. I can't wait. And good luck to everybody. Yeah.